country so barren, so dry, so lonely, it could kill you. The soft country, they call it, because of the soft, sifting sand, sand that whips your face, slits your eyes, thickens your tongue. For two days now, he's been riding, lost and losing hope. If he doesn't find water today, this country will quietly take him. It will be a day that will change the course of this boy's destiny and the destiny of Australia. For within his lifetime, this boy will become a legend. He will be knighted and he will achieve immense wealth. He will go on to become the largest landholder Australia has ever seen, building an empire across this country that has never since been equaled. Yet money won't be his motive. a philanthropist, a visionary, an opportunist. They'll call him ruthless and mean, loyal and generous, yet they'll all respect him. And few will know that it all began on this day in 1872, the day he nearly died of thirst. That's when this young man realized a basic rule of the bush. You need water. He would take that rule and apply it on an epic scale, spending a lifetime battling the elements across a vast continent. And along the way, they'd call Sidney Kidman the Cattle King. He spent his whole life locked into a life or death struggle with this land. Land that he loved so much. Land that brought him to his knees so many times. Sidney Kidman understood this land. He knew it intimately, as a friend and as an implacable enemy. It was the sort of land few others would take on. Harsh, uncompromising land. Land that allowed no mistakes, no misjudgments. Land you had to respect. Never seen a drought as bad as this one, Pratt. We could lose close to a hundred thousand head. <laughs> Just when you think you're winning. She knocks you sideways. She knocks it sideways. Sidney Kidman had that respect, and because of it, he was able to amass an empire that stretched the length and breadth of Australia. Over 100 properties he controlled, 125,000 square miles of the toughest land Australia has to offer. He owned more land than anyone else in the then Grand British Empire, and more stock than possibly anyone else in the world. When he died in 1935, he was, in our terms today, a millionaire many times over. Yet he was more than that. He was a master strategist, playing a gigantic chess game with nature, using his stock and his men as pieces, and the map of Australia as his board. In other words, that man was balancing himself against nature. And he probably found a way, better than a lot of people have, to do that.
I found that he was not a mean man, but he certainly expected it, his employees to be as frugal as he was. He was a great, great trickster and a joker. I don't think he needed to be liked. I think he needed to be respected. I don't think he ever felt that he was wealthy, except in the land which he loved. He was born near Adelaide, South Australia, in 1857. His father died when he was six months old. His mother had to bring up six sons. Sydney helped out by working part-time on neighbouring farms and at the Adelaide cattle yards. By the age of 10, he was working as hard as any man, saving a portion of his meagre earnings and listening to the stories of drovers who brought mobs down from places beyond his imagination. At the age of 13, he left home, determined to get a job up north on one of the big properties. With the money he'd saved over the years, he'd bought a horse, an aging mare with only one eye, which he called Cyclops. In his pocket was the last of his savings, five shillings. He was undertaking a journey of several hundred miles into some of the harshest, hottest country in Australia, where Burke and Wills had perished only 10 years earlier. The start of Sidney Kidman's journey was to be the start of a legend. He spent his early years working on properties around Broken Hill as a rouseabout, stockhand, shepherd. He would wander through the bush for months on end, hundreds of miles from the nearest town, tending sheep with the help of an Aboriginal mate. It was during these years that he learnt to understand the land. He grew to love the harsh country west of the barrier ranges. And he was forever asking questions, finding out as much as he could about the country around him, weather conditions, the stock he was tending. Graze them before we get it. Yeah, we'll give them a bit of a feed. The boy who ran away from home was developing into a young man with a tenacious memory and a mind eager to learn. It was during this time, too, that he learnt to respect the Aboriginal people, a respect he would carry with him all his life. He utilised them very extensively, those that were available, and um, his instructions to all his managers were to look after the Aborigines and to feed them well. They, by virtue of their knowledge of the country and their tracking ability, were the eyes and ears of any white man who lived there. And uh, Kidman would know, uh, obviously, that the Aborigines were the best possible uh, people to man his stations. We are in the sugar. No more left. We had it all last night. Kidman served a long, hard apprenticeship in the bush. It was a period which forged not only his skills as a bushman, but his character as well. No sugar. <laughs> well, I suppose I'll have to get used to it. Yes, you'll have to get used to it. Long time before you get sugar again. His weekly food ration was four pounds of flour, two handfuls of tea and two pounds of sugar. Everything else he would have to forage for himself. You funny fella. <laughs> it would force him to learn how to survive in the bush, how to track and how to hunt. Skills that he would use in later years to save his life. Thanks to right to me. You want some of mine? It was a period, too, that would instill in Sidney Kidman 
a passionate hate of waste. He would comment about a man who was using a match to light a cigarette or a pipe around the campfire and say, what a match, what a waste of a good match. That shouldn't be. There are coals in that fire, there are twigs or embers that could be used, and they should be used. Why waste matches? He really, though he, in a sense he didn't mean it, he thought of people like he thought his, of his cattle. He wanted them to be fit, well, and well looked after, and he realised that it must be food as far as his men were concerned. And he made sure that they got food. But if he were to come along and find that somebody had thrown away a half a tin of jam needlessly, or a bottle of sauce, or a bottle part filled with sauce, pickles, anything like that, this would upset him immensely. He could not bear that sort of thing. And he would not hesitate to tell you about it. By the time Sidney Kidman was 16, he was getting restless once more. Drovers coming through had told stories of the big mining rushes to the north and to the east. Kidman was no fortune seeker, but he could see an opportunity. That damper didn't turn out too bad after all. No, it was all right. We'll have to have some for breakfast too. What's across those ranges we saw today, Snyder? Uh, Coba. Big place? Yes. There's a strike on, I know that. But whatever it is, I don't know. A lot of people moving in there. Too many for me, I'm heading back towards the Darling. It's a bit quieter out there. Might be needing stock, horses, supplies maybe. Yes, I probably want some sugar too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I can probably take some sugar too. He spent the last three years working for other people, and that was long enough. He had money saved, and he had a head full of dreams. It was time to strike out on his own. He began carting food and provisions to the miners at Cobar. Tea, flour, jam, soap and sugar. Supplies were short and he sold his goods quickly. And within a few months he would establish a flourishing business, buying and selling on a large scale. His horse and cart would become a team of bullocks and his freight would be measured by the tonne. Kidman, quick to seize an opportunity, opened up a butcher's store, then began buying cattle so he could sell the beef at a greater margin of profit. And all the time, he was saving the money that was rolling in. Australia too was prospering. The mining discoveries were opening up the outback, and graziers were moving into the flat, dry plains of the interior with their sheep and with their cattle. For the young Kidman, still a teenager, it all meant business. They needed food, these men. They needed clothes. They needed transport. Kidman made sure he was there to give them what they wanted, all at a competitive price. He was very quickly learning the principles of business, establishing a reputation as a fair and honest trader, certainly a tough negotiator, but a man as good as his word. But not everyone he dealt with could be said to be the same. Often Kidman would get wind of a debtor leaving town at sunrise to avoid paying a bill. Kidman, though, was always one step ahead. G'day, Frank. I said, uh, there you go. Up early? Yeah, I was just going out and shoot a couple of rabbits there. Thought you might be going somewhere. Well, uh, to be honest, I'm just going to visit my mum, she's a bit crook. Is that before or after you get the rabbit? Suppose you want your money, Sid? I should need it for your sick mum, Frank.
When I took my first pack saddles to him, I waited at the office in Curry Street and uh, he uh, indicated that I should send him an account. And I told him that it wasn't possible for anybody in my position who didn't own any money at all to, um, to go on making goods because I had no money to, to buy the, the raw materials. And uh, I put this case to him. He said, uh, well, we don't do business like that. We always have a 30-day account. I said, well, it's not possible with me because 30 hours would be too long. I need it now. And uh, he gave a bit of a grin. He wasn't a man to smile much, but he gave a bit of a grin and he gave me the money. <laughs> Even from his early days working after school around the sale yards of Adelaide, Sidney Kidman had been fascinated by cattle. He soon realised he wasn't cut out to be a merchant, forever selling flour and tea across a counter. He wanted to be out in the bush, moving the stock he loved so much, maybe selling a few here and there. He very quickly got his chance, first selling as an agent on commission, later buying small mobs with his own money. It was during this time that he learnt as much as he could about the animals that would one day make him his fortune. Grab it like that. Cut that one down like that, down through there. Grab it back. Bring that on. Bring it on. Right. Up like that. Burn it in. There you go, Mick. By the time Kidman was 23, he'd saved enough money to buy a half share in a small property near Alice Springs. For Kidman, it was the realization of a lifelong dream. The property was called Owen Springs. It cost Kidman 1,000 pounds. 2,200 square miles, virtually smack bang in the middle of Australia. The homestead was little more than a shack. There were no windmills, no boars, no fences around the paddocks. The cattle had long since vanished. What do you reckon about this, eh? Yet Kidman didn't mind. It was his first property. rebuild the homestead, put up fences, and he would muster the wild cattle and sell them for more than he paid for the place. And within two years, Sidney Kidman would buy out his partner. His remarkable empire had been born. For the past ten years, Sidney Kidman had spent virtually all his life in the bush, rarely in the company of women. All that was about to change. He was about to meet someone as strong-willed, as dogmatic and as difficult as himself, Isabel Wright, a spirited Scottish schoolteacher from Kapunda. Go on, go on. Come on, boy. Come on. Come on. Sorry about this. Try and make the market before Saturday. Does that mean you've got to run them straight down public thoroughfares? You've got the whole of Australia to run your cows. Why pick this track? Well, there's no feed anywhere else. Well, I'm late for school and I'm cross and your cows smell. So get out of my way. Come on, come on. It was to be the start of a remarkable marriage that would last more than 50 years. Come on. And many would say, 
that it was this young, stroppy Scottish schoolteacher who made Sidney Kidman the cattle king. She encouraged him to go off and do things, and she taught him a lot of things. Um, as far as schooling is concerned, because he didn't have any education at all. You know, having left home at the age of 13, um, and eventually came back, met her, Scottish school teacher, and somehow everything clicked and it all worked. What's the longest river in Australia? Darling? Is that your answer, Mr. Kidman? Or your way of getting frisky? If it's your answer, you're wrong. And if it's the other, you're wasting your time. It's the Murray, and it's 1,962 miles long. Well, pay attention. And stop distracting me. But perhaps the greatest thing Bell gave Kidman was his freedom. She rarely complained about his long absences from home, even though he was often away for nine months of the year. She brought up their four children, including a son with polio, virtually by herself while Kidman chased his dreams throughout the outback. And all the while, she coped. That was her function. Not many could have coped with a man like Kidman. I can remember um, my parents telling me about when they used to go round to a ringer, where they were bitten for supper, and he would say, we're going to play Mahjong tonight, Bill. Get out the Mahjong. So the Mahjong would be out, and they would play for threepence. He hated losing. But on the other hand, when he lost, he would say to Bill, get your jewel box out at once and pay Muriel, that's my mother. Let her choose something out of your jewel box. And that's, that's how that was. Kidman began to diversify. He moved into the coaching business in partnership with a man named Jimmy Nicholas. Kidman supplied the horses, Nicholas the coaches. They started by running mail between a few towns, always reliable, always on time. Within a few years, they'd established a flourishing service carrying passengers, freight and gold throughout the nation, second only to the famous Cobham Co. Yet all the while, Kidman was consolidating his cattle business, moving mobs between states now instead of towns. And wherever he went, he studied the country, asking questions of those who knew, filing it all away in a faultless memory. His curiosity and willingness to learn was about to pay him dividends. It's come from many miles this water. Probably a couple hundred miles or more might have come down. It takes a long time to get here. It, takes, it might take five or six weeks to get down. It's one of the tributaries of the Diamond Tina that runs down. And it could come from way up the top end in the water catchment country. It was to be the turning point in Kidman's life and the start of the largest chain of properties in the history of Australia. The Cooper, the Georgina, the Diamantina. Three rivers that together built Sydney Kidman an empire. Their tributaries snake hundreds of kilometres from the north and from the east to lace the dry land they call the Channel Country in the southwest part of Queensland. It rarely rains here, but it often floods. That's because these creeks are fed by rains which have fallen hundreds of kilometres away in the tropical headwaters. 
And because this dry and dusted land is so flat, these rivers break their banks when they run, and floodwaters spill out over the cracked earth for 10 or 20 miles. So grass grows here, in the middle of the desert, even though no rain may have fallen in the area for years and years. Kidman quickly realized that if you owned a property around one of the three rivers, you had a good chance of surviving the terrible droughts that crippled the inland. And because he was a man who thought in huge terms, he realized that if you owned a string of properties around the rivers, you could fatten your cattle in the north and bring them down the river system to the markets in the south. A grand scheme, yes, but the only way Kidman saw of effectively battling the devastating droughts. And he's one great ambition was to have a sufficient tract of country in individual lots spreading over hundreds of miles, even thousands of miles, where he could move his stock from one lot to another in order to save their lives and keep them in good condition, but mainly to conserve the soil and see that it was not abused. And so he began buying properties, embarking on one of the most ambitious attempts a man has ever made to protect himself from the vagaries of nature. Each purchase was a strategic part of his epic plan. Each property was carefully chosen to be part of something larger. And slowly, gradually, his chain began to emerge huddled close to the river systems and the stock routes of this huge country. And as his empire grew, so did his workforce. Men as tough and as uncompromising as the boss they worked for. Kidman didn't pay them much, and he'd often make them work for 10 or 12 weeks without a day off. And those that didn't like it, he sacked. Sidney Kidman demanded total loyalty from his men. Yet there was something about the man that made one give that loyalty, in spite of everything. We're walking down and Sir Sidney Kenman is talking about these cattle. It just, he was overcome really with the fact that we'd got them to the market and they were beautiful. And anyway, he's telling these chappies about these cattle and the country. And he said, look, look, he said, it is wonderful country beautiful country. He said, look at those cattle today. He said, we haven't seen anything like it for so long. And then he stopped abruptly. He put his arm around my shoulder and he said, look, look at this young man. Nothing can help but grow fine and well in this country. He said, it's the most beautiful country you ever had. In 1901, the year of Australia's Federation, no rains came. No rains came the year after as well. And without any floodwaters from the north, the land slowly surrendered. Sidney Kidman tried to move his cattle from property to property, hoping to find feed and water. But the drought was too widespread. He simply didn't have enough land to escape. His stock began to die, a few here and a few there at first, and then in their thousands. By the end of the following year, Sidney Kidman had lost nearly 35,000 head of cattle, which meant that he was flat broke. Without any more stock to trade with, he toured his properties, paid off his men. Kidman's loyalty to his staff went as far as the black ink in his bank account. Good day, Dent. Hello, Mr. Kidman. Come to this, has it? Yep. Cattle all dead. Water holes all dry. Just trying to pull a bit of mulga to keep our horses alive. I'll have to pay you off, you know. You're the last fella. When you go, got nothing, nothing at all. That puts us both in the same boat.
Whose mob is that? Couldn't be the mob from Avon Downs. Thought we'd lost them. It is. It jolly well is. We might be up the hook yet, Dent. He would take those cattle to market and sell them for 15,000 pounds. Just enough to keep him going till the drought broke. Sidney Kidman had survived, but only just. Kidman quickly regrouped. With the 15,000 pounds from the sale of the cattle, he paid off his debts. He had 6,000 pounds left over. With that money, he began restocking his properties, buying drought-affected stock for a bargain, paying a small deposit, the balance to be paid six months or more after delivery. Sidney Kidman made that £6,000 go a long way. For once, nature was on his side. The drought broke and Kidman immediately began moving cattle, knowing the market prices were picking up, but he was taking an enormous risk. In five months, he spent nearly £80,000 on cattle. £10,000 on sheep, all on £6,000 deposit. If he didn't get good prices at market, he was bankrupt, well and truly. Kidman knew his stock, though. He knew their value, and he knew what the markets were doing. By the end of the year, he'd resold his last mob. He'd turned that £6,000 into a clear profit of £40,000. Kidman had traded his way out of trouble, all right but at the expense of the smaller landholders, who'd been forced by the drought to sell for a song. It was during this time that people began calling Kidman a cattle rustler, or poddy dodger, a man who steals another man's unbranded calves and puts his own brand on them. It was a time when huge paddocks went unfenced, a time when cattle from neighboring properties mingled and mixed, a time when a man could acquire thousands of head of cattle without paying a penny. Talking about potty dodging, you have heard the story that if ever you wanted to eat your own beef, you would go to your next door neighbour because he would kill yours and you would kill his to keep even. This was more or less, in a lot of places, it was almost an un... It was a sort of rule. But I will say this, that I never killed, and I was never instructed to kill the other man's cattle. In other words, I would have been told, my word, car, you jolly tinker, don't you do a thing like that. We don't want you out there doing that. You've got enough work to do without running around doing that, and you've got enough cattle of your own to kill without killing so-and-sos. And we don't want to set an example to him or to anyone else. You look after ours, never mind his. No, he was not a poddy dodger. From 1904, Kidman began buying properties on a scale never before seen in Australia. Huge tracts of land he bought, all according to his plan, all at prices well under their value. He would sometimes wait for years for a property, waiting till the owner was forced to sell. Bulu Downs, he bought, 5,000 square miles. Sandringham, 4,000 square miles. Glengyle, more than 6,000 square miles. Each place was bought according to its strategic position. Kidman's chain was stronger this time. A line of defense he thought would make him invulnerable to the drought. And as his empire grew, so too did his legend. Stories of his ruthlessness, his eccentricity, and his frugality were becoming folklore. Like the time he was supposed to have spent a morning picking up bent nails on one of his properties and straightening them. Or the time when he got some stockmen to pull down the veranda around their homestead because he caught them resting in its shade when they should have been working. He was a man who didn't drink, who didn't smoke, who never swore, a man who had no time for friendships, a man who distanced himself from everyone. That's right, don't you?
don't be shy. Come right in there. We want to tell you how much God loves you. And no one cares for you more than what God does. Yet he was an enormous contradiction, this man. He gave extensively to the Australian Inland Mission. He helped fund the Flying Doctor Service. And from his very early years, he supported the Salvation Army, making large donations as he became more wealthy. And you need to think about it and do something about it today. Many generous people have helped the Salvation Army. What about Mr Kidman over there, one of our greatest supporters? And when World War I broke out, he bought aircraft for the Air Force. He gave horses to the troops. And when Germany invaded Belgium and displaced the farmers there, Kidman organized a special fund to get them resettled. He promised those of his men who went away to war that they would have a job when they returned. He gave a pension to those that returned injured and a pension to the families of those that didn't return at all. By 1921, Sidney Kidman was sitting pretty. For seven years, the seasons had been good to him. He now had a network of properties that he thought was impervious to drought. He had an annual turnover of more stock than any other man in Australia. And he had men working for him that he was proud of. Sydney, when are you going to let those people know? I got another telegram today. What people? The government people. About the knighthood. Oh, well. I hadn't given it much thought. Well, you'd better. They want an answer. What do you think, Mrs. Kidman? I think it would be a good idea. It might make you into a gentleman instead of just an old drover. Old drovers can be gentlemen too, you know. He would be knighted for his contribution to Australia during the war. Yet this man, who now controlled more than 125,000 square miles of land, sensed trouble. He sensed a drought coming. A big drought. the drought of 26. That's when it started, this drought. Yet it was to last five years. For Sidney Kidman, it was to be the final challenge. Stock that in previous years had been fat and glossy began to look weak, hungry. And country that had once swayed with grass now stood lifeless and barren. Come in, please, Miss Brooks. Send a telegram to Inaminka. Find out how the tanks are going, what the bullocks are like. If they're all right, tell Skett to begin moving them south to Quinnaby. It's his decision. It's right away, Miss Brooks. Sidney Kidman was prepared. His chain of properties was now strong. His men were tough and willing to fight. Kidman was going to tackle the drought head on. He mobilized his cattle like a general moving his troops into battle. His territory was under siege and he was mounting his well thought out defensive. The drought though was relentless. It had settled on the land like a huge leech, slowly sucking the life out of the place. Many simply gave up as their stock died and their land became a debt collector's dream. They had no other choice. Kidman too was being pushed to the limit. 
most of his stock had already died, and those that were still standing were on the move to no place better. His men were losing hope. No one had ever thought a drought could be so widespread for so long. How are they holding up? Pretty light, sir. Pretty light. In need of a drink. All right, move them over to Durry. Bit of water there. Yes, sir. Okay. But by the time they got there, the water had all gone. That mob died as well. Kidman's master plan to escape drought just didn't seem to be working. The cattle king's lifelong dream was slowly fading. Blacks had the right idea. That's why they've lasted out here so long. They work in with the country. Not against it. That's what I've tried to do all my life. Work with the country. something like this happens. You realize you're out here on her terms. Not yours. It humbles you a bit, Pratt. I guess so, Sir Sidney. Kidman toured all his properties that year, bolstering his men's flagging morale like a military commander addressing a unit facing defeat. His drovers were getting desperate. To take a mob of cattle a hundred miles across flat, open desert towards a waterhole, not knowing if it was full or if it was dry, and to get there and find it dry, then face the prospect of riding another hundred miles to another waterhole. It was enough to make some give it all in. Captain! What are you doing here? There's no point in moving him, sir. They're going to die anyway. A lifetime he'd spent preparing for this very fight, with the only foe he'd never been able to buy out or beat. No room in my company for men who give in. Sidney Kidman's dream, his epic vision, was on the line, and nothing could stop him. I'll never be too old to move a mother of cattle, Mr. Pratt. Come on. When the rains finally came and the dust slowly cleared, Kidman's empire remained battered but intact. To that extent, he'd won. But it was to be his last fight. Soon after, he retired to Adelaide and settled down with his wife, Belle. It still operates today, the Kidman Company, but with 14 properties now, where once there was a hundred. And those that loved him remember a day in 1932 when a huge crowd turned out to celebrate Sir Sidney Kidman's 75th birthday. His managers and his men organized a spectacular rodeo to honor the man who'd been their boss for so long. It was on that day that someone wrote a poem. 
The old man sat in the grandstand, and he gazed at the oval below. At the boys in blue, at the boys he knew, round his heart was a sort of a glow. And his thoughts travelled far from the city, with its hustle and bustle and noise. He was riding back on the cattle track, riding with Kidman's boys. Once again with the green hide and stock whip, he was wheeling the mob on the plain. How they balk and clash as the writhing lash sings its staccato refrain. And his eyes, they kindle and sparkle. His head takes a statelier poise. The horses' manes toss as they bow to the boss. Aren't they ridden by Kidman's boys? For these are the men from the stations who ride neath the northern star's light. Where the salt bush blows and the mulga grows, and men must be men in the fight. Where they're not yarded by tram lines and no boundary of brick wall annoys, a thousand mile ride they take in their stride. Tis a day's work for Kidman's boys. And we who sit snug in the city and rail at the drabness of life, rave of depression and have an obsession that we were just born into strife. Let us take a cue from these riders and stop all this gloom that annoys. Get a stock whip and rope, put a lasso on hope and smile just like Kidman's boys. <laughs>